A central theme in uh, Confucian education, a central theme in Confucian education is to see, to experience, and to make connections, especially underlying connection, connections between apparently unrelated things, events, and even processes. When we say connections, in this sense, I do not mean simply relationships. To see that two things are related, this is, of course, to see the connection. But the Confucians assume more than simply relatedness. Once there is a connection, there ought to be an interaction, an interplay which presupposes some mutuality, hopefully in a more positive sense, mutually beneficial interaction and interplay. But as many of you must have noticed in the readings of Xunzi, Mencius, the Analects, now the centrality and commonality, which is the doctrine of the mean, that the Confucians are critically aware of differences and even conflicts. So the particular, the particular model they used in terms of the development of the person, after all, the primary concern is learning to be human, is a dialectic mode. Dialectic in the sense of the interplay between two different things, even conflictual things, hopefully, a reconciliation will be reached in the process. Of course, you can say the process of learning to be fully human is a process to integrate all kinds of uh, conflicting forces. Hopefully, a new equilibrium will be achieved. But I think the Confucians make a further claim, this is how we learn to be human in a natural sense. In other words, in terms of our daily experience, we interact with all kinds of things that are, some of them, radically different. And yet the model is not simply to simply accept it. Even you experience something which is radically different, still the idea is to try to find some kind of connection, some kind of relationship, the possibility of interaction interplay, hopefully, for the mutual benefit. This is not simply the idealized sense of trying to become fully human. This is also simply the notion that that's how we live, naturally, in ordinary human situation. In this sense, Confucian humanism can be sharply contrasted with uh, secular humanism that emerged in the modern West. Secular humanism is a form of exclusive humanism. By humanism, we mean it's not naturalism, it's not spiritualism. Last Tuesday, I, ma I made one reference to uh, Emerson. Some of the humanists wanted to define Emerson in terms of his idea that man is the measure of all things. Whereas some other people believe that uh, Emerson is profoundly religious. So they believe the best way to characterize Emerson is to use the statement from the New Testament, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Man is made in the image of God. So when, in the Western context, when you say he's a humanist, by implication, you're saying that he is not a naturalist, he is not a spiritualist, he is not religious. But in the Confucian sense, 
to be a humanist implies that humanism is spiritual on the one hand and naturalistic on the other. In a sense, this form of humanism intends to incorporate other worlds into this world, into this culture of ours. In a sense, this world of ours, even in terms of ordinary human experience, can be, writ can be enriched and empowered, enriched in terms of resources, empowered in terms of energy, if we understand it. Not simply humanistic, therefore it's not naturalistic or spiritual. It's humanist because it's humanistic. So it's also naturalistic and it's also spiritual. This reminds me of a rather interesting personal experience. In 1989, I had a fortune of attending a meeting uh, near Rome, the summer home uh, of the Pope. And he uh, graciously invited eight of us for dinner with him. So that was a good experience. And we uh, talked among ourselves and decided to make a proposal. So a dinner conversation went very well. We proposed that an encyclical, which means a papal letter, important papal pronouncement, be devoted to the sanctity of the earth. We thought it's self-evidently true meaning earth is not just mundane, earth is sacred because the ecological concerns and so forth. He was visibly moved and that summer of that uh, December uh, Christmas statement is all about environment. If you go back to 1989, I think we met him in the summer, so the uh, Christmas statement was all about an environment, very much a response to our request. But the encyclical, which is a formal papal letter circulated among the cardinals, the, the bishops, and high, up, high ups in the, in the Catholic Church, never came into being. Which means in the theological consideration, the sanctity of the earth, as opposed to, say, the kingdom of God, is still problematical. In other words, it's still difficult for some of the uh, uh, theologians to accept the view that earth could be understood as a sacred domain. Now, if earth is uh, sanctified, is spiritual as well as it's natural, by analogy, the human body is also a sacred, from the Confucian point of view, a sacred vessel for the realization of the human spirit. Because the person as the self, by analogy, is always an open system, dynamically transformative. The body then is never the prison house of the soul, but its proper home. In fact, the idea of the sage, the most authentic or sincere manifestation of humanity, is someone who can fully realize his or her bodily constitution. Because the original statement is anyone who is capable of doing that, fully realize your body, you become a sage. So it should not be theoretically gendered or cultured. Anyone, anywhere that can fully realize the full potential of the body, the body is a sacred vessel, then the person becomes a sage. This is predicated on the belief that the weight of heaven is actually inherent, meaning built in our biological reality. Whenever we are born as a biological reality, implicit or inherent in our biological reality is the secret code of the way of heaven. Uh, a very important scholar in ecology, also a major theologian, by the name of Tom Barry, is also a student of Confucian tradition. This is the remark he's made, and very convincing to me. That is a very specific Confucian concern, is that in the biological reality of being human, there's something 
encoded in that biological genetic constitution. That's the secret message of heaven. First of all, it has the two very important implications. The one, one implication is that the model for our learning to be human as a moral agent, to become moral, is the ecological model of interconnectedness. All the things are interconnected. To become moral is to become interconnected with all things. It's an, it's an opening up process because the self is an open system rather than closed structure. In this sense, the other implication is the idea of holistic well-being. So human well-being is not simply the well-being of the life of the mind. It is also the well-being of the body. Healthy body and healthy mind are interconnected. The profound person or the cultivated person informed by the sanctity of the earth and sanctity of the body cultivates his emotional life so that he can help others to transform the world from within. That's the reason I use the word organic intellectual. Organic meaning he's organically connected with the world here and now and organically connected with uh, other human beings as an exemplar. The whole text of uh, the doctrine of the mean or centrality and commonality is to teach how the profound person ought to cultivate his emotional life as a way of being moral, to, be, to become a moral leader, which of course has brought um, uh, political implications. The mean, on the one hand, is simply to find a middle point in two extremes. The mean meaning a balanced way of life. But even if we accept the Greek idea of the golden mean, the mean is never a mean in a static design. So it's not a geometric idea of the mean. It's not geometry. It's a dynamic transformative process. So how to find the mean not in a static situation like trying to find it in a picture or in a diagram, but how to keep it especially in terms of one's emotional life at any given moment in a dynamic process, requires that our ability to adapt to new and new changing environment, and of course, constantly adjusting to that environment. Implicit in that is we have to have a feedback mechanism that would tell us how to do it constantly to adjust to new situations. But the feedback mechanism is not only to report on what has happened, so how to adjust to that situation, but also to predict, to predict, especially to predict with increasing reliability what is going to happen if we are going to adjust ourselves well to the situation. We're talking about our emotional life. So the assumption is that in the way of learning to be human at every moment, we are very much conditioned by all kinds of emotive states and how to harmonize these, relate, these feelings and ideas. And so one will be able to negotiate the best possible course in the turbulent water of the emotional life. So how to handle one's feelings and emotions require not only cultivate the life of the mind but life of the heart and mind, and the life of the body and mind. In fact, Confucian learning can be characterized as learning of the body and mind. The important thing to bear in mind here is that the mean can never, can never be achieved if the energy level is very low. So the Confucian model is against 
any form of entropy, which means uh, a state of inert conformity. The energy is dissipated. So we'd reach some kind of equilibrium because we have no energy. The Confucian model is based upon very high energy. Therefore, it's tension ridden. The life is, is lived in a way that is a degree of energy is being generated. So you can, there are two kinds of balance. One is balance because there's no energy. The other is balance like two forces, you know, confronting each other with equal volume and in intensity. So there's a certain kind of balance. But the balance is based upon high energy. This cultivation of the person based upon this type of model is to cultivate the ability to anticipate how one's emotional states will occur. Not to wait until the emotional states are in full swing. Just give you one example. Now, many of the Confucians are involved in this practice called to control their temper, especially anger. How to deal with one emotion, which is very powerful, the emotion of being angry, anger. The assumption is, if you allow that emotion to become fully present, you become angry, there's very little you can do. You have to allow the anger to, to uh, subside. To control one's anger when one is angry, from the Confucian point of view, is like fighting against a mountain or trying to stop uh, the, the dam that has already burst. So the important thing is to try to understand oneself and to appreciate the conditions that will provoke oneself to become angry and to be able to do the management beforehand. This, of course, applies to many other emotions as well, jealousy and so forth. So it's an anticipatory, you can even say proactive way of creating favorable conditions for self-realization. You reach that kind of equilibrium, not after the fact, but before it presents itself. A scholar of uh, civil engineering, a very uh, a friend of mine by the name of T.Y. Ling, one of the most important uh, engineers in this country, who actually is responsible for, responsible for building uh, uh, the tunnel for the BART in the Bay Area. And he also became a devoted student of the doctrine of the mean, centrality and commonality. And I'm convinced by him that the mean in the doctrine of the mean or centrality in the doctrine of the mean can be better understood in terms, of the en in terms of the term in engineering. The term is optimization. This is how he's argued the case. So what is the mean? What, what does it mean by being equilibrium, being timely? It means that in any given situation, your ability to mobilize all your energy, to understand all the conditions, and to find the best solution to the problem. The, the most appropriate fitting way of dealing with the situation and hit the mark. This is the meaning of being central. So this, this notion of optimization is to optimize all the conditions. Of course, it's predicated on what we call a veil of ignorance. You know, any given condition, there are so many things that we do not know. The things that we do not know, we cannot do anything about it. But to be aware of the things we do not know is an important form of self-knowledge. So the superior self-knowledge is predicated on one's ability to harmonize one's relationships and to manage one's emotional life before the various kinds of uh, emotive states have come into being. One common practice that's been used by the Confucians based upon this particular line of thinking is quiet sitting. Just sitting quietly, quiet sitting. 
And if you haven't done uh, this kind of exercise at all, I would recommend you do one experiment. Uh, it's very useful for me. The unexper one experiment is to try to sit for one minute, just sit for one minute with a simple goal that in that minute you try not to think about anything. Just sit for one minute, no more, S 60 seconds. And the goal for that is not to think about anything. Of course, in that, in that one minute, you shouldn't just fall asleep, right? You just sit for one minute and not to think about anything. It's marvelous. You may discuss it in the sections. What is your experience? Most of us just can't do it. Try not to think. Forces you to think about all kinds of things. And if your mind is, bl is blank, all kinds of emotive states occur. Now, the argument here is take very seriously all these emotive states that occurred when you sit quietly because they are an integral part <clears throat> of your being. They are the emotive states of who you are. And you need to recognize each of them. This is the Confucian notion about wisdom. You know, to be wise, to wisdom is not necessarily to know all kinds of other things, but know yourself how these emotive states actually come into being. Courage is your ability to see the dark side of your psyche. If you are very jealous, you're angry, you're, you're really, uh, you don't want to tell anyone, but you really don't like your roommate, you don't like the other people, all these very powerful emotional feelings, even though they never expressed, they are realities to your life. And you sit and they present themselves. The courage to face up to the dark side of your life is very important. Teach yourself to listen to the inner voices. But also requires compassion. Don't be too harsh on yourself. If you get into this sense of being guilty, and it could turn out to be a vicious circle. And also, you need to exercise your judgment about rightness. I'm very jealous of the guy. Is it because my jealousy is justified. The guide is too arrogant or something else. Or there's some kind of deficiency, something that I want very much to have, but I don't. And ask yourself, even if I don't have it, would it actually affect me as a person in terms of my own well-being? Am I too harsh on myself? Is my judgment about myself basically wrong-headed? This is the way to develop a sense of self-confidence. So not to be overwhelmed by the emotive forces that we don't know why. Passion is a very powerful, sometimes extremely dangerous force for everyone. We know that. And how to, not to manage it, but to channel it, like flood, you know, like the sage King Yu, who was able to try to develop an irrigational system to allow the flood to flow. You can even use that image in terms of you, your own emotional life and the emotional lives of the many people you're constantly in touch with. This is how you try to understand yourself, how to appreciate your inner psychic, your emotional forces. But this is also from the Confucian point of view. I think that link sometimes is very difficult for us to make if we are not seasoned in that style of, moral, uh, style of reasoning. This is also the cultivation of moral leadership. So the leader in the moral sense is someone who's master, he, who has become the master of his or her own house. In other words, has become, you become the master of your own body. And that master of your body is predicated on your tremendous respect for the sacredness of your body, which is, of course, not only a gift from your parents, but a gift from heaven and earth. And the person who is able to harmonize his own relationships, to cultivate his, uh, not just life of the mind, 
the life of the heart and mind, and also life of the body and mind, can serve as a standard of inspiration for others. So in this sense, the person can become even a teacher. So a leader is a teacher. But a teacher or leader, I call it organic intellectual, is not necessarily a Socratic teacher. In the classical Greek sense, the Socratic teacher is the teacher who knows what is the essence of sincerity, what is the essence of truth. And most of us do not. So the teacher would lead us from our normal, uninformed way of life to a kind of enlightenment of understanding the essence of sincerity. So the teacher is always a step ahead of us. The teacher will guide us to try to understand what's going on. But the Confucians do not have that presumption. The teacher does not necessarily someone who, who's embodied that particular essence. So the teacher may be a fellow traveler, but because he's older or she's older and may have obtained certain kind of wisdom, courage, idea about the overall situation. So it could serve as a standard of inspiration. In this sense, Xunzi has made a statement, only after you've learned, you know that you are deficient. Only after you've learned to teach, you know how difficult learning itself is. So the teacher is someone who knows learning is difficult. So a teacher, a leader, or a moral exemplar is someone who is able to provoke us, to inspire us, or to elicit the best in us. Not someone who can superimpose some kind of ideology, certain kind of uh, packaged knowledge to overwhelm us. So this, in, it is in this sense that Manchu said the teacher is someone, or the, even the sage is someone who's obtained my heart before me. He's not a different creature, not a superior being, but he seems to have identified some qualities of his heart and mind that serves as a standard for me. So he's gotten the best of my heart before I've done it. It is in this sense I can learn from him. The purpose of this kind of moral leadership is, in my argument, to create a fiduciary community, a community of trust. And a community of this kind is based upon communicative rationality as contrasted with instrumental, instrumental rationality. Instrumental rationality, especially in economics, only instrumental rationality functions. That is goal-oriented. You know what you want. Your thinking is a calculation. I pay this much, how much I'm, I'm going to get back. It's a negotiation. So go, and also it's a means and end dichotomy. I use a means to obtain certain kind of end. Normally, in the modern academy, only one form of rationality is being taught. That is instrumental rationality. Rational choice, economic calculation, computer science, in everywhere you learn only one form of rationality that is, uh, that is uh, instrumental. Communicative rationality on the surface doesn't produce anything. You exercise it, you immerse yourself in it, it doesn't produce anything. It doesn't have a benefit that can be calculated as economic benefit or political benefit. It is based upon reasonableness, not based upon certain kind of rational calculus, based upon reasonableness. But how is communicative rationality cultivated? Why it's important for us to cultivate it? In one tradition, which is in, uh, in Germany now, in one tradition, the emphasis is on the ideal speech situation. In a sense, the ideal way that we can talk to each other, communicate with each other, sometimes verbally. This is the way to cultivate communicative rationality. It may, may be a little bit difficult, uh, difficult for us to grasp. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
forget about your learning in terms of the formal, but focused on the extracurricular activities, especially those clubs and organizations, basically for the sake of you cultivating your, your hobby. A chess club, I don't know whether wine tasting is allowed, but wine tasting, or the, a club for animal lovers. Now, when you go into a group, uh, let's say wine tasting, the people who are in that group develop a language to communicate. Uh, this particular bottle is sweet and, and uh, very fruity and aged very well, and that one is not that. The language they use is often not at all comprehensive to us, outsiders. But the communication is very fruitful. People really know what they're talking about. Because what they talk about is based upon a shareable experience. If you don't agree, you taste it, you probably will agree. That's true with uh, people who master some art like chess, or imagine the parents talking about their children, or the animal lovers talking about you know, dogs. And the shareability of that, of that makes the language and conversation very, very reasonable, very, very e uh, easy, to, uh, easy to comprehend, which presupposes a great deal of not only goodwill, the intention to communicate, and also the outcome, which is not the outcome in the economic calculus, the outcome of sense of fellowship, uh, sense of communication, sense of connection. Even the minimum conditions for this kind of ideal speech situation to occur are very elaborate. It requires good intention, correct attitude, and of course, some of the behavioral criteria. How do you do it? Now, I'll give you one example. If you met a stranger who approached you in Harvard Square and asked for some very simple information, then you began a brief, you intended to be brief, conversation. And the conversation could turn out to be very nice. You never met the person, but ask a polite question and so forth. But in the course of that conversation, even a trace of suspicion occurred in your mind. You're not sure whether the person could be dangerous or not. You're not sure whether the person is really sane or maybe even insane. Any trace of that suspicion, conversation stopped. There's no way to continue. It is in this sense that the basic condition for the ideal speech is trust. Very, very basic. You have to have some kind of trust. It is also in this sense, it's very difficult in the human community to develop anything we call edifying conversation. In other words, a conversation that is so edifying that people who engage in the conversation or benefit from that communication. In fact, some philosophers now define the best philosophy as a form of edifying conversation. Now, you may want to appeal to your own experience. The other one is dialogue. Dialogue is extremely difficult. You have to make special effort to engage yourself in a dialogue but because it presupposes that the two, two persons involved in the dialogue will be mutually benefited from that conversation. It's transformative. Now, the trust in this sense is a very basic quality in the formation of any society. We know there is a, a simple statement in the Analects about the three major features of any society. You have to have soldier to protect the society because the importance of security. You have to have food and you have to have trust. Now, the when the question is asked, which one could go first? He said soldier, next food, trust, never. We never given a great deal of thought to that kind of idea. Is it simply undefensible idealism? What trust? Trust cannot be transformed into food or national security. 
But I think what Confucius was trying to say is the essential feature of forming a community. If you don't have that, you don't have a community. It doesn't mean that you have it, you have a community. But if you don't have, you don't have a community. But if you don't have military security, you don't have the basic economic subsistence, you can still have a community. So the question was asked, let's say, I'll give you one example, I cannot get into this, very complicated and many interesting uh, observations have been made. So what is the essential feature of being American society, for example? Many people, well, we have a lot of land, our military hardware is unrivaled, economic power is great. That's why America is uh, a superpower. But I think if you follow this Confucian argument, the focus is on what some scholars call civil religion. Without civil religion, there's no America to talk about. What, what is civil religion? It's based upon declaration of independence and the Constitution. The argument shapes like this. The declaration of independence, when the statement is something like, we consider this, uh, we consider this to be self-evident or self-evidently true, the self-evidence means it's not a rational argument. I'm not going to present a rational argument. I simply want to articulate a faith or a statement about what our convictions are. These are our convictions. Let's say empirically, a major group of people working on uh, biogenetics at Harvard proved that men are not created equal. Men and women are all totally different. Would that change our dec declaration of independence? I think what happens is that even if empirically it becomes clear that we are not created equal, we still insist that they, they are. Men are created equal and that each of them bears inalienable rights. That conviction, that faith defines the civil society becomes what America ought to be or what America is. Without that conviction, without that trust, without that basic belief, you can have all the hardware in the world or the economic power, you do not have the soul. And so the argument here is that a society comes into being because of a particular ingredient rooted in the, in the common trust in terms of a shareable ideas. So society is formed for the sake, based upon values, but also for the sake of creating and continuing with those ideas that are meaningful to us so that our life is worth living. So the argument is not a minimum condition, how we survive. It's the condition under which our life becomes meaningful, becomes worth living. You know, the classical Greek notion is if the life that is not reflected is not worth living because that life is like any kind of animal life, it's not human life. That's the reason why the human being is considered rational because you reflect upon your life. So the life that is not reflected is not worth living. In the Confucian sense then, the manner of living our ordinary life matters a great deal to our well-being and by implication, the well-being of society as a whole. It's not that we live, but the manner we choose to live. And that choice is the base upon the convictions and the values that inform the meaningfulness of our life. Now, the underlying assumption of society as a, as a fiduciary community is what I call an anthropocosmic vision. Uh, we have a chance to discuss more fully the meaning of the anthropocosmic vision later, actually uh, April 18th, I guess, in connection with uh, some of the neo-Confucian mode of thinking. But let me summarize the uh, interpretation in the doctrine of the mean, or in its centrality and commonality here. Again, the importance of connection. 
many people complain that uh, too many big words are used. Uh, I'm critically aware of that. Now, the reason why they are big words, part of the reason, well, my idiosyncrasy, I think, one of them, but uh, part of the reason is because the words that originally are not connected, in the Confucian mode of reasoning, they will have to be connected. Now, if they have to be connected, so you combine relatively big words into super words, I guess. And it's uh, out of desperation. Now, one thing I think you're quite clear with, I often use the term ethical religious. Now, ethical religious actually means ethical and religious. In a context where ethics and religion are not only separable, they're not connected. To use ethical religious is totally meaningless. For example, in our normal understanding, you know, outside of the Confucian world, ethics is based upon rules that govern our moral behavior. That's ethics. Religion is based upon faith. Once the faith is at stake, rules are no longer relevant. So the religious life is clearly differentiated from ethical life. In that context, not only there's no need, it becomes totally useless to combine these two terms and use ethical religious. But in the, in the Confucian tradition, to be ethical is not only to follow rules and regulations, but to be able to develop yourself fully. To try to develop yourself fully, it's important for you to go beyond your species consciousness. In other words, to go beyond what you consider to be a member of a species. In other words, to go beyond the anthropological realm. If you want to go beyond the anthropological realm, then you have to see the possible link between the ethical realm and the religious realm. Therefore, you have the term ethical religious. Now, in this specific situation, the, the whole idea of being human is not anthropological. We have a whole field called anthro anthropology, is a study of human groups. The reason why it's not anthropological because inherent in that movement, in that, in that argument, is to fight against anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism is only to think in terms of the interests of the human species because the interests of the human species are the most important. They are supreme values. In so doing, you can become very, very not only uh, critical of, but aggressive toward nature. Now, the Confucian argument is that you cannot be fully human if you do not try to harmonize the human beings as a whole, harmonize relationship with nature. So in that sense, the anthropological idea in the Confucian tradition carries a cosmological meaning. And therefore, you have to try to bridge two realms, the realm of the human, which is anthropological, and the realm of the spirit, or the cosmic force beyond the human. Therefore, the term anthropocosmic. And yet, the term is not my uh, coinage was borrowed from Gabriel Massal. This is a French scholar, a French uh, religious thinker, very much seasoned in Catholicism. Actually, an existential but Catholic thinker. He already passed away. He tried to understand the relationship between being human from the Christian point of view in the relationship of the human to God. So in order to link these two relationships, he developed this term anthropocosmic. Now, the connection, of course, is critical. The connection is based upon the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of what we ordinarily have, each one of us ordinarily have before even our cultivation and what the universe is all about. So the assumption is the capacity 
of our heart and mind to learn, to know, to appreciate, and to make connections with other human beings and with things near at hand or distant, meaningful to us, is definitely unlimited. L let me repeat this, this, uh, this statement. The, the interconnectedness is based upon the belief that the capacity of our heart and mind, xing, I used it, both uh, the affective aspect of the xing is the heart and the cognitive is the mind, our heart and mind, not only to learn, to know, to appreciate, but to make connections with other human beings, with things near at hand or distant, meaningful to us, is totally unlimited. It is in this sense that everything is in us. Everything is in us in the sense everything is in our sensitivity. It's in our ability to make connections. This is the reason for the assertion. If you just look at these words, they may be big and difficult to digest. But the assertion is based upon very common experience, basic experience. The word imminent, which means internal, inside ourselves, imminent. The idea is that since our nature is being conferred by heaven, so right in our nature, in the nature itself, our human nature itself, there's the secret code of heaven. The secret code of heaven is inscribed in our biological reality. So just being human, embodied with this heart and mind, there is an internal link between ourselves as human beings and heaven. Now this on the surface is diametrically opposed to the notion of heaven or God as holy other. This is of course a very important theological position, not accepted by everyone, but an important one. That is, God is the holy other, which means radical transcendence. Our human rationality, no matter how comprehensive, can never really know internally what God really is. Otherwise, it's uh, blasphemous to say we know. But if you have a notion that inherent in our own nature, in our human nature, is the secret code of heaven inscribed, it doesn't mean it's apparent. We have to discover it. We have to realize it. So inherent in our human nature, there is a transcendent dimension. In a sense, heaven resides in our heart and mind in a latent form. Strictly speaking then, Confucian humanism is not anthropological. For inherent in its philosophical anthropology is the way, capitalized, the way, indeed heart and mind of heaven. And understanding of the religious dimension, I'm not saying that it's a religion, the religious dimension of Confucian humanism requires that we appreciate how the way of heaven is realized in human affairs and that human humans create values on behalf of heaven through our ordinary human existence. To the Confucians, the greatest mystery is not the distant star or supernatural phenomena on earth, but life as experienced and humanity as embodied. In other words, the most mysterious for the Confucians is how we live our ordinary life the manner we live our ordinary life. Now, in conclusion, I have only one minute now. Heaven is uh, omnipresent, which means the heaven is everywhere. And perhaps it's also omniscient, it means that heaven is aware of everything. But heaven for the Confucians is not omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. We humans are therefore duty bound to help to realize heaven's inner truth through our self-realization, both personally and communally. This is in the sense we become entrusted with a mission 
the mission is not just our own mission to realize ourselves, but to help nature and heaven realize themselves as well.